We are a group of ultimate players, coaches, and video enthusiasts. We've worked with the major federations and the greatest events. We're on a mission to make Ultimate huge. We want our videos and live streams to be free to watch. We want to make stories that not only okay. reach you, but also reach people outside the Ultimate community. Like and subscribe, us be the best in the world. Become a member and fund, fund our, our work, work to cover more events in the future and to bring more stories and live coverage to the eyes of the Ultimate world and, and beyond. beyond. That's why we're making a global showcase, starting in Europe, made in Amsterdam. Ultimeek. held in photo albums, drinking stories, the rest right is a gift. And here at Ulti TV, we want to make sure we always appreciate it. Capturing the immortal moments Yeah, the Ulti TV Wi-Fi is being shitty. Sure everyone can enjoy spot it yourself. for free. For ever. Was that because your hot spot, your, was that your phone was also going for the Ulti TV Wi-Fi? To all Normally, yes, but mine hasn't been, so I was like, what the hell? Yeah, I know. Uh, you can you can if you want to use Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to glorious Bern, Switzerland, for the Elite Invite. It is finals day, but before we get into the finals, we have the small matter of the mixed semi-finals to decide who is going to be taking their place in the final game of the day. On the other field, at the far side of the complex, is Deep Space from London versus Disconnection, but here on field one, We've got a repeat of last year's EUCF final. It's Reading Ultimate up against Chris. Benji Reese back with you in the booth here and delighted to be joined on this glorious finals day Monday morning by Charlotte Stenerson. Hi everyone, hi Benji. Indeed, we have 
a replay of the last year final of EUCF Reading against Hood. They are playing to see who is going to final, but not only. As we know, the two first teams of each category are making their way for taking the golden ticket for EUCF directly without having to play EUCR regionals to qualify. And here, the winner of the semi-final is actually already winning this beautiful ticket to go straight to EUCF. So, intense game coming up. We say golden ticket, it's not actually golden. So, I think mainly because we don't want to get into copyright troubles with Willy Wonka, but... In our heart, it is golden. Its value is gold. And obviously, both of these teams would expect to be qualifying through regionals anyway, but it's nice to just know that you've got the job sewn up early, isn't it? Makes things easier to organize your season. One less tournament weekend of Ultimate, knowing that most of these players are playing also at EUC in Limerick this summer, representing their own country. And a lot are even the youngsters taking part to the World U24 Championship happening in Nottingham in July. A lot of Ultimate, a lot of tournaments. So obviously keep your eyes peeled and keep them locked on Ulti TV. It's been an interesting tournament for both of these sides who had very differing fortunes between day one and day two. Hrut absolutely rip raw to wins on day one. Took out Pook 15-6, we streamed that game. And then a 15-8 win over Deep Space, but had a stickier day yesterday. Went down 13-11 to Mosquitoes. And then a kind of grindy, gritty game against Smog, 12-9 in the quarterfinals to take their place here. For Reading, after a comfortable 15-5 win over Smog in the morning, they struggled mightily against Disconnection, just looked like they were out of energy by the end of that game. They went down 12-9, but redeemed themselves remarkably yesterday morning, a 15-10 win over Seskidistas. And then dispatched the Mosquitoes, who of course had conquered Kruitz in their previous game, 15-9 to set up this EUCF final rematch. We've seen Reading level change drastically from the first game stream to the second. Is the level going to be even better now? I hope so. I'll tell you what, if this is a match between day one Hrut and day two Reading, we're in for a treat, but that's not a good start. As Wedge throws it into Wilhelm, not enough height on that huck. Ten Harkin wants to sneak that one through to Minard and does so. Fakes the underneath, then takes Epstein at the second time of asking. Epstein resetting to Minard, reaching out with the right hand, continuing the flow to Ten Harkin, faking the over the top. I mean, you have to respect that from Chris, because you know that they will put it. Munkau, back to Ten Harkin. Ten Harkin zips it into Dunshan and the Austrian Catches for the game's first break, 1-0 Hrut. And that is a very inauspicious side for the start for the British side. And a really good start for the Hrut D-line already breaking at the beginning of this semi-final. Fortunate mistake from Reading, not seeing the player of Hrut ready to get in the way, get the disc, and straight to the end zone. Just nowhere near enough elevation on the deep shot from Wedge, and it allowed the defender there, Wilhelm, to just pick that off and get Grit's offense rocking and rolling. With gender ratio rule A as in effect, we switch the gender ratio after the first point and then again every two points subsequently after that. And with Aaron Morton in the disc in his hands, you see that there's four male matching, three female matching players, and thus we've got a male matching puller. The incredibly crumpled and creased shirt of Morton to pull. <laughs> Withers fields cleanly. First passes to Lewis. Wedge clears out. Open space for Collins. Instead, it's swung towards the far side for Withers. Back to Lewis. 
Now Wedge has the disc in her hands. Thinks about the break to Hogan, instead going central to Lewis. Recycling the disc well, Reading here, without gaining too much field position. But as I say that, they are able to crack things open a little bit to Collins. Collins finds Klima. Hogan takes off deep. Instead, it's the underneath cut to Wedge, down towards the far sideline. Wedge wants to thread that one into Hogan and does so to tie us at one. Much better offensive possession, that, from Reading. Indeed, beautiful gainers from the Reading side. Good cuts with continuations, making a beautiful play for the offense, who had some pressure since they couldn't score the first one. They had to make that one clean, and they did. Clean offense, no turn. We see Redding hesitating for the hug, but a much better option. Heading for Wedge, throwing the assist to Connor Hogan. And Hoagie, we usually see him more as a thrower than as a receiver, but he is capable of getting downfield when he needs to. One apiece here, Krut with that break on the first point. Reading will try and earn this back now. First D-line for Reading. First O-line for the Amsterdamers. Is that what you call someone from Amsterdam and Amsterdam? We'll I think it sounds good, Amsterdamer. We'll go with it. Even though, even if it's not the right word, it sounds good, so. <laughs> Milan's giving me the thumbs up and I guess you would know. Amsterdamer it yeah. is. Blading pool fielded, and the first pass is to Blasman. Runs a little one-two with Kulats. Kulats to Molnar, the Slovakian, first season on Hrut. The sunglassed Janssen. Everything staying in the backfield right now for Hrut. Molnar breaks it open slightly. Looks at Blasman, looks away. Greer's providing some sticky coverage in the dump, but eventually Blasman finds a way through. Minard. High, high release flick. That's a lovely throw there to Janssen. Fakes a high release flick of his own, but instead just going to keep swinging it back and forth. I thought that throw could have gone from Blasman to 10 Carter, but he had other ideas. Getting it back from Janssen. High release over the top into floor. Kulats. Smooth as Swiss chocolate there from Hrut, and it's 2-1. Beautiful give and go by Blasman, who sped up like explosiveness from this guy, just after the release of the disc, went straight for the second pass for then an assist to Floor Collards. Beautiful motion of the disc. Look at the replay. And just always trying to keep the disc moving quickly, not getting into too high stall counts. And when you've got throws, you kind of have that wingspan that you see from players like Janssen and, and Blasman. It does provide you with those different angles of attack. You see it here from the high drone angle. Just creates that window by stepping out hugely with that pivot to put that high release backhand in. By the way, I loved the high release flip from Menard earlier in the possession as well to Janssen. Delightful. It was, wasn't it? Wedge stops the roll. Hogan picks up. And fakes to Wedge. Then Collins all oh. with a drop in the center. I think guilty of just taking her eyes off it a little bit too soon to try and find the next option. And Hood losing no time, attacking back. High release over the top, a little too high. Oh, it very nearly fell into the lap of Dunshan. Epstein with a call on the throw, though. Was the throw out of his hands <laughs> by the time there was contact from Withers? That's got to be the question that they're talking about right now. But nice attempt from Dungeon to save the disc. <laughs> I must admit, having listened a couple of times, I'm still not sure. I accepted foul. 
So the session comes turns back to Hood. What can Epstein do with a second opportunity? It's the around break this time. He does link up with Dunshan, the Austrian and the American, finding that connection and that chemistry. Menard, who's playing a lot of work early, just anchoring the offense after the turn. Lovely uh, bounce backhand through towards the far oh. sideline, miscommunication, and Withers pounced on the opportunity to earn the disc back for Reading. Great reaction from the Reading player, Ben Wither, throwing himself to get a defense for the team, retrieving the possession, and getting a chance to score this offense. Collins clearly unfazed by the earlier drop, trust from her teammates as they go right to her with the first pass. Hogan slashes up line, reaches out with the left, snags it in. Fakes the continuation down the line. Just adjusts himself slightly. Finds Naden. To Wedge, two GB World Games teammates connecting. Wedge down the line. And Andy Ooh. Lewis with a little bit of toe drag swag to tie us at twos. Just in the corner. Good job, Redding, retrieving the disc. Another break would have been very painful during this semi-final. They don't want to find themselves in this situ situation. And here you see again, Wither getting the block for his teammates and himself. For the score. Back in the far corner of the end zone. Yeah, you're probably going to see actually maybe a little bit better from this high angle precisely how much room Lewis had to work with. That's really well done. Balletic almost. The drone is back in action today. Just providing us with a, uh, a bird's eye view of things. Two apiece. Clutch with that break on the first point, the only break of the game so far. Second O point for the Dutch. Molnar catches. Of course, not Dutch, but you see what I mean. <laughs> Ten Carter. Bardol to Blasman. He's got Walt Janssen wide open on the far side. Takes it, floats this throw a little bit to Minard and. It was Kulatz, excuse me, the receiver, but Hagen with the disc hanging up there. Kulatz had to stop slightly and Hagen charged through and knocked it away. Reading with the disc to bring us back on serve. Here's the break opportunity. They can retrieve their advantage. Are they going to do it? Is Hood going to get the disc back? Thompson finds Brown with the first pass. Brown across the field. Here's Knight. Piper takes off. Thompson was screaming for it, but didn't get it. Still might be Thompson trying to blade over the top, put enough finesse on it to access that space in the Canadian's hands. Again, just sitting this one out into space. Millard had a wonderful bookends yesterday. Again, he's shooting for the far corner. <laughs> and it is again, fancy footwork. This time is downtown Joe Brown steering Reading into the lead, 3-2. Beautiful hammer and what a curve. The player had to give some footwork here to follow this path of the disc. Great put in the far corner again, as they did on the opposite side. Same, but in the other end zone flying over all the stack. Have a look at the beautiful defense from Jennifer Hagen. And I think Reading did this very well, is that when they go into high stalls, generally they put those flows out to space with touch to give someone the chance to get into position. And that hammer's just beginning to helix a little bit in the end, but Brown does the right thing, gets two hands to it, has that awareness of exactly where he is on the pitch as well, to know that he'll need to tap the toes and give Reading their first lead of this contest. Amazing, we love upside points. 100%, especially 
there is a bit of wind around this weekend. It's not as strong now as it has been at previous points. But if you throw those overheads, it A, opens up the field, and B, as a defender, you know that you have to respect those fakes, respect those cuts a little bit more, because they've shown that they can throw them. Cannot be a lazy poacher if you know that the upsides are coming. Janssen oh. faking the big that time. Maybe that could have gone, but he wants to be a little bit more secure with it this time. Blastman. After a break, you want to make, make sure you can score and not throw a 50-50 hook. Kalartz getting it around the mark of Hagen. Back to Blastman. Kalartz again underneath, not far outside the end zone, into space. Oh, oh you could see Brown try to adjust to peel off there, but lost his footing in any case. I'm not sure that he would have got there before Molnar, who makes it three apiece. But still could have made a bit of pressure. Fortunately, grass is a bit slippery in the morning and cleats are sometimes not enough. Yeah, especially as you mentioned, when it's first game of the day and there's dew on the surface. Yeah, you do lose your footing a little bit more frequently. Expe especially with the explosivity of these players Exploding, as I'm saying, everywhere on the field, cutting, jumping, and giving us a good show. And I appreciate that we have some bias, given that Philip is a member of, a, of our Ulti TV crew. But it's nice to see a player making a step up to a bigger stage and, and showing that he belongs, of course. He played previously with, with outsiders from Bratislava and uh, played with uh, Force Electro of Delft at the World Championships last year where uh, his career highlight came, getting a layout D on Ring of Fire's Terence Mitchell, which is, you know, not a bad return. Not bad, not bad. <laughs> oh, my. Here's the ball from Hruet to the edge. We'll take it into the lap of Lewis. Taking a little bit of time to get the movement downfield, low release to Wilson. The 230s against each other. The Austrian Jakob Dunshen on the mark, leading pass there for Lewis. Underneath to Hogan. Wonder if there's going to be an effort to get it off the sideline. There is indeed a round to Wedge. Wedge putting some air underneath it. Ooh. Not a problem for Lewis climbing the ladder in front of Stenica. And Lewis into the end zone for Hogan. His second goal off the game. It's 4-3 to Reading. Beautiful jump from Lewis. Knowing exactly where to jump despite of the defense putting pressure. That's a beautiful read. And jump. Nice execution. This is exactly what you want from a game that, yes, it's the rematch of last year's EUCF final, but here at the Elite Invite, you know, where you do say anyone can beat anyone, there's no easy games, and these two sides going at it, hammer and tongs, barely a hair's breadth between them. It's, it's, it's fitting of the name Elite Invite, isn't it, really? Like, it's exactly, it's exactly what you come to these kind of tournaments for. It is, it is. The best ultimate you could wish for in Europe. I think even if there was not the potential free pass to EUCF on the line, teams would still want to come because you do want to test yourself against the best competition. That is why Shad also keep, uh, came still in Elite Invite. They got a spot uh, at the... Padova, spring invite, but that doesn't mean you don't want to come here because this is one of the best preparation you can wish for, as you're saying, Benji. And sometimes you learn more from those defeats against good opponents than you do from those victories. Plasman and Janssen playing 1-2 in the backfield. Janssen wants the around break. This time he has it. Bardol back to Janssen. Mostly Janssen and Blasman at the moment. Little scuba over the top, finds Minard in the pocket of space. Snapping that one in and out now, really using the full width of the field. Bardol finds Janssen. Uh, there is a stoppage for a pick. We'll go back into Blasman's clutches. Gonna, trying to get Kalartz isolated at the front of the end zone, but we've had another pick downfield. Oh, 
Lou checks in. Minard to Blasman. Blasman to Kulats. It's low oh. and it's off her hands. And she knows that, yes, it wasn't the easiest catch, but she would back herself to make that, what, 99 times out of 195 at a minimum? That's a hard one to catch, a bit low. Maybe a layout could have secured the catch. Thompson finds Greer. Greer to Knight. And a, just a miscommunication there with Thompson, oh. who came through, but the swing went into the backfield to no one in particular. Redding missing a chance for another break. And they and are ruthlessly and mercilessly punished with Blasman sneaking it through the inside channel to Kalatz for the score. Finally, they get that connection down this point. Who's securing the score? They need to, because if they want to have the chance to take advantage, they need to break. And before breaking, what do you need? Scoring your offense. You do indeed. Been, uh, been a bit of a game of runs so far. No side has ever got more than... I say that, no side has ever actually got more than two in a row. So it is very back and forth. It is. And we don't have so many turns so far. In total, I think we had six of them. Which is good maths. <laughs> which is uh, not a lot, knowing we're already at 4-4. They have pretty clean offenses. Yeah, the game's got a good pace to it. Not, we've had a couple of stoppages for picks, but no, we had one foul call. But otherwise, the game's kind of kept moving, kept ticking over. Which always makes it a more enjoyable watch, I think. Reading choose to let the pull drop. Hogan fields from the floor. And Lewis, here's the first deep shot of the game, really, for either side. Lewis oh. is <laughs> right on the money to Naden, and Naden's in the end zone for the score. You did wonder it's a matter of, this matter of time. Both of these sides are happy to open it up, and why not when you can do so like that? We're talking about clean offenses. This is a clean offense. One pass to the end zone. Why need more when you can do it like that? Fast offense so that the D-line can take all the time to try break the opponent offense. They're just a little bit slow in getting into position there. So Hogan has time to pick up, flip it to Lewis, and he can really, without the force there, he doesn't have to worry about being pressured on that throw. He can see the whole field developing as well because there's no one right in his field of vision there. And I'll tell you what, absolute peach that to Naden. Beautiful. I do, you do always wonder a little bit with Fruit. Obviously, they're a much more mature team now than they were when they first burst onto the scene. But certainly, if you got your deep game going, it tended to spur them on to do the same. We'll see if they get sucked into playing that game of dueling deep balls or whether they just try and keep things calm in rhythm and work it underneath, utilizing the swings as they have been so far. Blasman, this time he fakes the deep shot. Molnar, back to Janssen. Janssen with the expansive fake before the swing to Molnar. Molnar to Minard. Blasman takes off deep. There we go. He's going to try and track it into the end zone and a little bit of milk as well. Going to the dairy is Blasman. Beat Greer deep for the goal. Wait, I saw some hang signals from Minard calling a foul on this throw. But Wait. how come that was foul? Look at how beautifully the disc went how until can... the end zone for the score. How can you be fouled and throw that? Look. Let's have a look on this throw. Beautiful. Maybe Thompson actually comes across, just catches that at little, very close to the point of release, but it's an absolute dime from Menard. And it is. That was a textbook case of upline throw, power positioning, and deep hug to your teammate right in the end zone. And usually that's not Menard's job. Menard just kind of does the sensible things, takes the resets, keeps so, the disc moving, finds those little pockets of space. But 
Hey, when you get someone who's open with separation and you can throw it like that, I think throwing the deep ball is a pretty sensible option. Oh, it is. And so it is five even, five, five, and not six, four, as you could see on your screen. But Reading still in advantage, starting on offense. And Paul's going to land out of bounds. I think Hogan will probably take this from the brick mark. Hogan with the around break to Lewis. Wilson begins to charge off deep. It goes to Hogan and now it's Lewis's turn to try and eat up the yards. Well, I guess we're in Europe, meters. Wilson with the put looking for Naden again, trying to track this one as it goes to the right hand side. And Naden just keeps the defender on the back shoulder, boxes out slow and makes it 6-5. Real good boxing out from Naden, yeah, she couldn't play the first stream game and when you see all the work she puts on for the team, yeah, you understand the, the difference of level. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say that uh, Yeah, we didn't see her against Disconnection on the Saturday. Picked up a knock in the, in the smog game. There were, you know, wonders maybe if it was a concussion. Thankfully, by the time Sunday rolled around, she was good to go, okay to play. And you could see the impact she had, as you kind of would probably expect from a World Games player being available again. Oh, yeah. Obviously, for those of you who missed this drama, there's been a slew of flights cancelled from Heathrow Airport in London. Uh, Emma Klima and Connor Hogan were also not available on day one because they just straight up couldn't get there in time, which is more than unfortunate. But them coming in for the Sunday, plus Naden, it just gave them such a huge lift, I think, getting those reinforcements after they looked pretty red-faced at the end of day one. Not through embarrassment, but just because it was very hot and they looked mighty tired. Leading pass here to Molnar. Blasman's going to take off. Molnar needs no second invitation. Can Blasman climb the ladder? Oh, we mistimed the jump. Millard just tips it over the bar as well behind. Decent look, I think, that. Uh, the throw maybe could have been a bit flatter, but I think Blasman just misjudged it. It's been a game of hugs here, and uh, previously the defense from Hood uh, was trying to avoid these and poaching a bit on the deep side. So let's see if the, this line has the same instructions and wants to prevent these deep hugs. Reading set up their stack very far away from the handler to create all sorts of underspace. Thompson with the layout, <laughs> keeps it up. Continuation to Lou, that one's low, but again alive. Piper charging off deep, throws not coming instead. Oh, Millard, Millard does really well to stick the catch. Millard winds up the arm to Knight. Knight brings it down, it's 7-5 to Reading, another break for the Brits. Another break! Reading putting up the gap here. They know they need to take as many points as possible. And we got a timeout called. So we're going to take a break as well and see you in a bit. Don't go anywhere.
Group 5, Reading 7. Reading with their second break of the game to put themselves in pole position here. Hrut choosing to call the timeout. Charlotte, if you're part of that Hrut huddle, what do you think's being said? I guess they must have said what they already said before, uh, seeing their defense. They want to stop these hawks. Whether it's the guys, the girls, everyone's going deep on Reading. Everyone's hawking these throws and they are scoring them. That's the hardest one. And so I guess they have to readjust their defense and do something to prevent those throws. Either the throws or the runs, but do something that it doesn't so, continue. So just stand deeper if the play is downfield, trying to force them underneath or maybe get a bit flatter on the force. Force, exactly. force it to go more laterally rather than downfield. I like and the thinking. I, I mean, I, I, that's, I, that's what they've been doing, actually. The D-line from Hood has shown this kind of defense, really putting themselves behind the players, but still Redding knows how to make their way through that. Joe Brown cleans out Floor Killars. Just uh, coming together, thankfully, nothing more. Janssen has the separation. Gained some meters underneath. Oh, Janssen pops up the throw again. Not the first time he's slightly air mailed one to Janssen. And Hagen's been there to help prevent the disc being completed. Brown to Hutchison. Redding trying to break for half here. Leading pass down the sideline, and Brown could never quite catch up to it. Hutchison misjudged it. What can Hrut do with the second life? This time, speared into the gut of Kulards. No chance of popping that one up. Low for Blasman, too far out in front. Right on the precipice of halftime here are Reading. Big pressure on the Hood all line. What is happening? Reading's putting it all and have here in front of the end zone another break opportunity for the half. Hutchison comes out of the end zone. They find the poach wide, wide open is Brown. Could scarcely imagine a goal to be so open in a game of this magnitude. Reading on a three point run to take half 8-5. This is very much day two Reading, isn't it? This is, and I would say as we were starting the game, the level is increasing even more on the Reading side. We see that they're hungry. They want to get their golden ticket and they also want to take their revenge on Hood for the EUCF final last year in Kaorle. And look, we've seen Reading versus Hood enough times to know that this game is never over until that final point goes in. But Reading have to feel happy about the position they've got themselves into now. Half time here, 8 5 Reading lead in this mixed semi final. We'll take a quick breather and we'll see you on the other side. for the sport, for the world. That's why we're making a global showcase, starting in Europe, made in Amsterdam. Ultileague.net Thank you. 
Welcome back to the Elite Invite here in Bern, Switzerland, mixed semi-final action. Reading up 8-5 on Hrut, going into the second half with Hrut receiving, trying to clean up some of those offensive miscues that we've seen from the Dutch side so far. Yeah, Reading, DV line on fire, fighting for all the discs. They really want to get this win. But let's see after a halftime talk if Hood is going to find their momentum and break this strong Reading D line to get the scores. They need that much. <gasps> oh my word. Oh. Millard knew pretty much nothing about that. But he made himself big enough and just the fingertip to deflect it away from Kulats. Interesting defense there from Reading. Had the females matching up against the handlers. Put the guys downfield maybe again to try and get some bigger bodies behind and underneath the deep shots. And it came up a treat. Dude has eyes on the back of his head. Crazy no look defense. Raise your arms, you never know what can happen. Oh. Right past the bidding Molnar. Hutchison can't take advantage though. Fakes Molnar trying to make himself active and bouncy on the mark. Still rising. Greer on this near side. Hutchison now takes off deep. Switch there. Well passed off by Reading. Molnar comes to Millard on this sideline with the rainbow sweatband on his left wrist. Hutchison. Underneath to Greer. Greer uncorks it. He's looking for Millard for the bookends and he's got it as well. Double happiness for Millard for Reading. 9-5. And again, these offensive miscues are really hurting Hutz. And one more break for Reading. This is already the fourth one of this game. Three more breaks than Hood did, taking advantage. Hood what on offense, I think. They're just giving the disc away far too easily. They are. We, we don't know Hood that way making that kind of mistakes. That's pretty unusual from them. Don't know exactly what is happening to the team. Did they not enjoy their s uh, sleep in the Swiss bunkers? Or maybe Reading is actually just killing it. Yeah, sometimes you have to hold your hat up and say, like, we, we mentioned this a little bit earlier in the game that sometimes when you go big against Quit, they can get sucked into playing that sort of game as well. And Reading have been much more effective at shutting down the deep shots. With the exception yeah. of the kind of the one that was a little too a little too low that wedged through on the first point that led to that hurt break. Otherwise, Reading have been pretty much inch perfect on the long bomb. You're right, Benji. That's what we were talking about before. Hood trying to shut down these deep options. And indeed, Reading has been doing that very good. Now, by the way, that turn on the first point, one of only two turnovers for Reading's O-line this game. But it's a lot harder to turn over an offense if you get that brake train rolling because your offense is just <laughs> on the field less often. <laughs> How do you want to break an offense if they're not playing? That's now a goal, two assists and a block for Millard. Ten Harken into the center to Kalatz. Goes for the offhand, back to Ten Harken. Glassman. Makes it very clear he wants that traffic out of the way. Puts a little bit of edge on the throw round to Ten Harken. Feels like they are telling themselves that we are going to have to put away the more expansive swashbuckling side of our offense. And they are going to slowly but surely work their way down the field. There's a pick in the stack. Gives everyone some brief respite. Kalatz doing a lot more work in the handler space this point. Ten Harkin pumping the backhand, going to Blasman. Blasman wants the disc back, gets it. Minard. 
Dishes off the backhand, goes back up line, gets that power position, but there's no real continuation. Kalas was in that space. Here's Vidcom. Glassman, aggressive breaks, attacking the break side. And I really think just going with the slow and steady game worked dividends for Cluet back on the board after that th four point run from Reading. The game nicely poised at six to nine. What a pressure from Reading defense because you know how good Hood offense is, how athletic the players are, how good they throw, how fast they are. I mean, they took a while to get to this end zone and this is due to Reading very tight defense putting a lot of pressure and making the work as hard as they can for Hood O-line, who successfully got a score. It had been a long time coming, that point for Hood. Now let's see if their defensive tactics are going to be enough to shut down these deep options from the Reading O-line. I mean, you look at the game clock there, we've literally just ticked over 40 minutes. So there is plenty of time left in this game for Krut to make a comeback. And, you know, as we've seen both when these two sides have faced off over the years and in various other Krut games, they are never out of it. Lewis has Wilson clear out from the isolation in the centre of the field. Wedged slashing towards the far sideline. Huge underneath to Collins. What's the continuation? Uses that height well to get the high release backhand back to Hogan. Hogan, he uncorks it. Munkow trailing Collins. And Collins, ooh, ooh. that is close. Yes, Becky, of course you can look at the replay screen. I love how none of the players wants to let the disc go even when talking. <laughs> Oh, and then let's see some speed control on this replay. Ooh, that's a close one. I think they're deciding that the catch was... Either for offense or at the same yeah, time, if, if but... it's not simultaneous, it's close enough that you couldn't tell. And, and Collins just about reels that one in. But I, I think Munkow has done a very good job there to nearly peel for that one away. Yeah, what a defense, but unfortunately, as we know in the rules, if the these get caught simultane simultaneously whoo, by offense and defense, offense keeps the disc in possession. As a, if you're an O-line player, that's the rule you love. If you play <laughs> D-line, I think you feel it's probably a little unfair. Oof. I wouldn't say unfair, but frustrating. Oh. That, well, I mean, that was mighty, mighty tight. We got an update from uh, the other field. It is 6-8, eight, 8 in favor of, and I don't understand what uh, this means. Uh, that is a glitter ball. Glitter uh, so ball. I've got no idea. This connection leading 8-6 on the other semi-final. As Kulart rifles that one, but into the floor. Not been the best game out there for one of Hutt's talismans. The wind picking up a little bit as Hutchison picks up mm. and he puts air underneath this one. This is surely going to invite all sorts of bodies underneath it. And Yangson quickly gets it back for Hutt. Kalatz has to put this one, but Hagen steps and peels off <laughs> and gets the block. She knew what Kulatz wanted and was very smart to step back and get the block there. What a release! Now Thompson throwing through a bit of traffic. Greer makes the catch, blading too far out of reach. There had been a stoppage back at the previous throw. Not sure what it was. Uh, potentially a foul call on Minard, but everyone downfield continued playing, so I think they might just say the turnover stands here. 
I don't understand what happened on this throw, but it was pretty fancy one. Almost split <laughs> to get the range needed for a back and hook release, despite of the defense who knows what's coming. And then the backhand, sorry, the backhand, the forehand blade from Greer was expansive, but it was overshot. First point in this game where either side has, well, sorry, where both sides have turned it over multiple times. Blasman to Janssen. Janssen, oh, pops Ooh. that one up. This time, Kulats climbs the ladder. See that the wind is beginning to have a bit more of an effect out there. Molnar, oh, Blasman <laughs> snatches it in front of Greer. And his hat falls off in the process as there is a stoppage for a pick. Oh, I see why it was the glitter ball, because it's disco next year. Oh, hola. <laughs> all right, all right, Nemo, we'll let you off. We got it. <laughs> got there, got there got in the air. Good one. Good one, Benji. Couldn't figure it out myself. As Minard gets the up line with the offhand, backhand. Now Molnar. Resetting to Blasman. Blasman going to go for the give go up line. Hutchison just flattens up on the mark a little bit to stop that throw going. High release to Janssen on this near side. That's very wide fakes into the centre high. But Molnar gets up. Now Minard. Back to Blasman. Sees the space there for Molnar. Four Ooh. steps round. Janssen past the bidding brown and fits it into Kulats. There is a pick. What intensity, everyone fighting for the disc. You cannot stop at all. You gotta attack every single disc for you. It's a game of inches. Thought Play for maybe, every inch. Sorry, I was gonna say, I thought they could have maybe fit that one into Kulats. Instead, Kulats oh. with the frankly insane layout snag to make it 7 10. What a snatch that is. As you say, insane. A side layout extending for the body on the side. I was going to say, I think generally Hagen's done a pretty good job defensively of not shutting down Kalatz, but minimizing the impact. But look, sometimes there's just. Sometimes there's not a lot you can do, is there? There was the block that Hagen got by peeling off to stop the huck. Even when she was not having her strongest game, you know that she can always find the big play out of somewhere. It's time Blasman taking on the aggressive break, and that is picture perfect from Floor Culatz. What a grab! Culatz showing how it's done. You want to win, you want to get to finals, you want to get the direct tickets to EUCF. Got to give it all. And boy, how Hrut want that ticket because Northern and Central Regionals are combining this year. So for Regionals, Hrut have to go all the way to Malmo in Sweden. And yes, I know it's in the south of Sweden, but that's still a bit more of a trek as opposed to Reading, where they'll, I think no matter what happens, they'll surely be at UK Nationals in Nottingham in August. On a rising stall, Withers can't come up with it from the dump from Wedge. A chance for Kroot to force their way back into the game. Seneca. Seneca. The run through block comes from Wilson. Was trying to find Aaron Mawson for the score. It's the first time the uh, Kroot D line have touched it since. Uh, let me do some maths here. Since the fourth point of the game. That was the break opportunity. They were so close to getting it done. But Redding understood the assignment. Wilson stepped in and took the defense and the disc back. Oh, oh. What a grab that is from Naden. The, the reaction, the adjustment when the throw was offline. 
Wedge aggressive with the leading inside backhand. Big pressure from Rote on the handlings to... <laughs> and then sorry. Collins using every inch of the wingspan to get it. Can, can I make a full sentence? There are so many things happening. But I want to say, yeah, big pressure on the handling. You see what kind of throws you have to go for. You can either throw a simple upline or simple dump. Good players are everywhere, making it hard. Great job. Tiptoeing the disc to stay in bounds. But there is a call, obviously. Yeah, it looks like Rachel Naden's coming off on an injury sub. Maybe when she made that earlier catch, just landed a little bit awkwardly, winning herself slightly. Klima will come on as a replacement. Meanwhile, for Kruitz, Walt Jansen replaces Joris Stenica. Because when a side makes an injury sub, the other side gets to make a change as well to make sure that you can't utilize it for your advantage. And this time, it throw into a tight window to Klima. Kilarts runs through to get the disc back. Kruitz crossing more of their offensive stars over to the D-line here, knowing that they need to eat away at this Reading lead. Here is Kulats. Fakes the flick. Lefty. Squeezes it past Withers to Mawson. Steeline offense looking a little bit out of rhythm for Thrit. Epstein and Mawson playing it between themselves. Now Janssen on the sideline marked by Lewis. Oh. And Mawson just has it bounced out of his hands. Laser he wasn't ready for and here's the deep hook. Lewis picking up and the blade is a bang on the money to Wilson taking advantage of the turnover with the deep strike. Mawson's head was dropped for a second. Sam Wilson stole a march and it is 7-11. That was always open. As you say, they took advantage of the turnover because Hood was doing an amazing job shutting down these hucks. As we were saying earlier, but with the turnover, with the defense not having time, the Hood defense not having time to set up, Redding got the shot they were looking for since the beginning and got a point. O-line got the job done. Yeah, the first time they kind of earned the disc back with Wilson's run through block. There was the catch from Naden that is frankly ludicrous. Let's, let's be real. I think she's probably earned herself a point off or so. Collins made a really tough catch on the sideline, but maybe conservation of greatness. Kulats with the run through to get it back, but then after Mawson just had it kind of most unfortunately from his perspective rattle out of his hand. Lewis grips it and rips it. And it's 7-11. Time for a Slurpee. I hear you, <laughs> Seth. <laughs> On the Slurpee thing, right? I think, I, think, I think all raspberry fans should have a beef with strawberry, right? Because why is raspberry blue? In what world is raspberry blue? Anyway, we'll move on. <laughs> Just think about all the horrible food colorings they have to add into that to make it that. Not that they don't have to have horrible food colorings into all the colors. Okay, I've, I've said my piece. Let's go, let's play Frisbee. <laughs> Molnar fakes the backhand. Instead it goes to Minard, that opens up the around here to Blasman. Again, looks like the Reading cutters being backed a little bit. They want to force them to work it down the field. Test the patience of the Dutch. Around, Blasman's going to have to dive to get this. And he slides across the grass with the disc in his grasp. Janssen. Low fires into Molnar. Wearing that bandana around his neck as he usually does. Minard. Someone's lost a hat. I think it's Blasman. Little barbecue dad backhand to the forehand side to find Minard. Travel called. Minard gets back into position. And Minard just feathers a frosty flick into Janssen and makes it 11 8. But Kruitt. They've done the first part, they've put the O point in, they need to generate more pressure defensively. Although having said that, they generated pressure on the last O point, they just couldn't get the job done after the turn. Exactly, they lost the disc they fought so hard to get. And I mean, they do need at least three, no, four breaks now, if they want to have a chance to take advantage and win, because this gap 
11 8 that was unexpected i have to say from my point of view as really unexpected especially when you see the results of uh, ECF where the game went to universe point i it think did, if indeed. i remember well and so you would expect such score here i don't know in which advantage but a universe point i mean tighter game if you can cast your minds back to the UCF final, then if you haven't watched it, my God, please, because it's an absolute stone cold classic. But Reading's D line, whenever they got the disc, they were faultless. Reading's D line turned it over once all game. Unfortunately, it was on the last point with Lola Dam's ridiculous layout D. That was amazing, insane. So I'm sure Reading will be pretty pleased that Lola Dam's taking a season off and isn't out there. And you can feel, you can feel her, how would you say, like her, her missing absence, on the, yes. her absence. Thank you. I'm with you there. Hogan does not care about the wind, hangs one deep. Collins oh, with a brilliant read to reel that in. And God. floats it away for the goal. Look, obviously Collins has the stature that helps bring down the deep shots. But with the wind under that, it's very easy to misread. And I think she did a very good job. Oh la la, that was a good catch. So many people around that disc. And Redding made it with the score. And it is 12-8 now. We are 55 minutes into the game, so still have a lot of time. It is 25 minutes till the end. so. We might even get to the 15 points before time is over. Uh, in the other semi-final, 10-7 disconnection was our latest score. And also, I'm going to mention this. Collins, as well as, you know, strutting our stuff out there for Reading, one of the organisers of one of the UK's finest indoor tournaments, SICKO, that takes place just outside of Brighton. Do I mention this because I am one of the other organisers? <laughs> who, could, who could possibly say? I'm sure it's just a coincidence. There we are. Got to get my bits in. There you go, having a good performance out there is Collins, a goal and an assist. New to Reading this year, played with Bristol in the women's division at WCC last year. Coming over to mixed division and fitting in very well as this one is absolutely ripped what a from bomb. Janssen. And <laughs> You just need either a bit more touch and finesse on that, or maybe a bit more edge, just to, rather than the flat rundown, I think, from Kalatz, because she's fast, but she's not quite that fast. But also, if you make it a bit more floaty, you know that the Reading defense will also get there. Lou, oh, oh can't chase it down on the change of direction. Blasman. Picks up again. This is going to pop up a little bit, but no problem for Kalatz to chase down to make it 9-12 into the corner. Lovely little throw to space there. That huck from Janssen was one of the problems they got in in that shocker of a loss to Mosquitoes is that they were guilty maybe of overthrowing people either by, you know, not putting enough touch on the throws, just getting the edge a little bit wrong and making them too flat and zippy. And again, came to bite them there. Just this time, Redding couldn't capitalise and with the first throw, Blasman utilising that low release, sending it out into space, giving Kulas the opportunity to go down and chase it. And that was one that she was never going to pass up. This is actually also what happened during Hood's first game of uh, this tournament, uh, the streamed one, the Against first Boot. one we had, exactly, where both teams needed a, b a bit of time, and especially Hood, to adjust their hugs. They threw out thrown a lot of hugs uh, at the beginning, and then after adjusting it, Everything went perfectly and all hogs arrived in the hands of the receiver. Beautiful puts. But they needed a bit of time to adjust and feels like a replay here. But we are in the semis and the score is much higher already. Real zip on that ball that Klima catches to Hogan. Hogan to Withers, Withers to the far side to Lewis. Collins takes off down the far side of the field. But trying something a little bit different defensively. 
seeing if they can stymie Reading's flow. Reading, to their credit, seem relatively untroubled by it so far. Keeping the disc just pinballing around, a little bit of Plinko in the backfield. Still camp beginning to rise, but Lewis and Hogan just happy to play this small ball between themselves. Lewis now on the sideline, swinging across to Withers. Withers to Hogan. They continue to slice and dice. Back to Wilson, his first touch this point. Now Lewis. Collins makes the cut to the cone. The break's not there. Still count beginning to rise now, really for the first time this point. There is a stoppage. Potentially a bump on the mark. Checked in. Lewis to Hogan. I think that's a pick. With all due respect to Hoagie, suspiciously open, given that he's being marked by Walt Janssen. Lewis again, faking the backhand to Hoagie. Finds the little window that he created there to Withers. And a Reading could do with sorting out this spacing, I think. They've had a fair few picks this possession. Since Clip transitioned into going one on one. <laughs> Withers really wanted that break, didn't he? But it wasn't there. Now Stockout's got to rise. Oh, Ooh. the lefty is a little bit behind Lewis. They just got gummed up on the end zone line, and Clip do get the turn. Minard. Throwing now to Kulartz. Kulartz, oh, down the wrong line to Janssen. Hogan picks up. Little dish to Withers. Back to Hogan. Withers thinks about the upline, doesn't like it. Bounces back central. There's got to be a bust somewhere. Wedge comes three towards the far sideline. Two away from victory now are Reading. It is 13 to 9. Very quick attack from the Reading D line. That was the D-line. That was the D-line. That was the Reading O-line. That was the O-line, okay. My bad, I don't know how to read stats. But very quick reaction after the turn to make a mess there in the end zone, but make their way this for sure. I think for a lot of a lot of Kurt's key players, it's been a very up and down performance. They've contributed positively, but they've also had some miscues that I'm sure when they look back, mm. they will, yeah, just kind of maybe wonder a little bit how they how they managed it. Because that is a relative freebie to give the disc back, just miscommunication between Kulatz and Janssen or the throw came weird out of Kulatz's hand. Just stuff that you don't expect to happen to a team like Hurt and Hogan to wedge for the goal. Mm. And in front of the end zone, that is a Christmas gift. Is indeed. I mean, 39. Reading is two points away to get their tickets to EUCF and get to final later today. Yeah, we're going to take a little bit of a breather as there's a timeout, it seems, oh, yeah. on the field. We'll be back with you very shortly. July from Nottingham, England, the World Flying Disc Federation's World Under 24 Ultimate Championships. Live all access coverage, including semis and finals, exclusively at ultiworld.com. Thirteen to nine, the current score. It is eleven nine to disconnection in the other semi-final. Benji Reese and Charlotte Tadasson with Steph Rapazzo on the stats for this mixed semi final. Good with the offense. A little floaty one down line. Molnar gets it. And Molnar just finds Ooh. the window down that sideline. Whitcomb with a little bunny hop backwards into the front of the end zone. And. He 
again for Khrut, that's what you need. You need to put these opponents in as quickly as possible. He certainly didn't want to risk to have to throw another throw to get a score. As quick as possible, as you're saying, Benji, the job is done. Now it's D-line time for Khrut to try to retrieve this points they missed the gap that grew and grew during the game four breaks it is what they takes for them to take advantage and have a chance to win four breaks benji what do you think about that what yep. would be the strategy to get that given that they've only broken on the game's first point it feels like a big ask they tried the zone defensively and Reading worked through it well until the red zone and then that didn't quite work. Maybe you say, okay, we'd let Red we you know, we'll force Reading to take the big shots, which you kind of feel are generally a lower percentage, but Reading have been nailing those, so that's not really an option. I just I'm not sure what I'd do in this point. I just whatever you whatever defense you have the most confidence in, I think is the best option here. And just bag the players out there to go and kick it up a notch and get it done. I mean, of what we saw with Hood, I would say that their best defense is the person D. But would, as we have all also seen so far in this game, Reading is doing amazing against that. Still rising. Wedge, oh. a little bit high. Klima couldn't quite wrap her wrist around it. As I'm talking, Reading is losing possession of the D's and Hood with the chance of a break. Mawson. Tossing to Minard. With the stall rising, Minard is able to break the force to Mawson. Slob. Back to Minard. Low miscommunication and the run through from Wedge. I think this is maybe more the problem for Fruit. Because in the second half, they have generated turns on Reading, but they've just had no clinical edge when they get it. Wedge is poached here, by the way. She should get in and she does. Now, oh, an ambitious oh. one. Had the option there through to Naden. I like taking it on, but just too far for her. Great save attempt, but it is too far indeed. Hood can get a chance again for a break, but are they gonna use it well? Is communication going to be here? Are they going to Minard take it? Using the, uh, using the opportunity of the up line, the force coming flatter to break it off, slow. Well, 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 well. Minard, plenty of space underneath the Wilhelm. There's a pick in the middle. Might be the reason why there's plenty of space. Everyone stops running. <laughs> I'd explain that. Ten Harkin. <laughs> Stenica. Lawson's going to take off down the far side of the field, but instead they know how important this possession is. They are going to slowly and surely try and into the way around as Minard reaches, gets it on the stretch. Naden sitting underneath in that space. Lawson with a very loose force from Wilson. Just trying to reset, recycle, taking on the break to Munkau. Trying to isolate Minard, now Mawson. Still count rising. Able to blade it oh. around and it's out of the hands of Mawson. Again, Reading able through hook or by crook to continually get the disc back after their O-line turns it. The handlers in the downfield just did not seem to have any synergy or connectivity at all. Lewis picks up, Wedge isolated. First cut, gets the disc off the line. Breaking around to Wilson. Lewis, I thought was gonna head towards the far side of the end zone. Instead, nice break down the line to Withers. Withers wants to leather that inside flick through to Klima. Klima continues the break to Wedge. Travel call. Travel call. It wouldn't surprise me if this throw just goes up again. 
Instead, Wedge clears out. Klima into the backfield to Wilson. Wilson out in front of Wedge. Enough float on it. Wedge to Collins on the far side. Rips it away with the right hand. Reading within one. It is 14-10 in a game to 15. I don't know if Hood got the instruction not to play deep, not to play hugs, or is Reading defense really good at shutting down this option? But during their attempt for a break, Hood had wind with them and this is perfect for Hawks, so that was weird, I knowing that's their way of playing. I think it was that patch, that four-point run that Reading had either side of half-time, when Krut had a few deep shots that didn't work out. I wonder if that maybe that spooked them and they were like, we can't keep turning over like this, so we'll, we'll bottle that for now. But, you know, to an extent, you're hurt, right? You have to have that element to your offense, A, because usually you're good at it, and B, because otherwise it really compresses the field for your offense. Exactly, and we are 10 minutes away from the end of this game, but one point away for Reading. And on the other pitch, it is 12-10 in favor of disconnection still. So for now, it looks like a Reading disconnection final, but... We still have 10 minutes to go. Let's see what is going to happen. If, that res if the results hold, it would mean that both, all three finals are rematches of pool play games. They would. Kalats underneath. Faking the flick hug. Janssen. Says, not me. This needs to go there and Blastman, I think, as he was just trying to bring it down, has it weasel and worm its way out of his grasp. Hutchison, not necessarily had his best game with the disc in his hands. Finds Thompson that time, though. But here is the opportunity to win for Redding, who loses it with a too high re release disc. And for some reason, Blastman just wanted to play a little bit of football here. I think probably to give his side the chance for the uh, slower pickup out the sideline, but... I mean, that was... <laughs> that could have been a tip to get say, the disc. A, I've seen people do... I've seen people kick the disc and have it end up in someone else's hands again. And B, I'd much rather stop it and get going quickly. I mean, you are allowed to kick the disc to get it. You're not allowed to tip it to reach the end zone. But this is another loss of the disc for Hood. And Redding might make game here. Just an overthrow on the swing to Blasman. Thompson marches towards the disc with a final berth on the line and a ticket to EUCF. They are a few meters away from the victory and EUCF qualifications. Greer being marked by Janssen to Millard into the end zone and Reading break for the win. 15-10 final score. We will see them in finals later today and we will also see them at the EUCF in Wrocław in autumn. Here it is, here the victory for Reading, taking revenge on Hood for the EUCF final, qualifying their team for EUCF. Straight away, they get one of the two tickets available for the mixed division. Congratulations, Reading. Amazing fight. What a game for Reading. Beautiful points, great defense, amazing pressure on this famously known good team, I mean, the great. For Reading, the job's only half done though, because yes, you got your ticket to the UCF, but also one more game. You've still got to go out and win the final, and I bet that they'll be fired up to so disconnection that they did not get their best game on Saturday afternoon. There's the stats for you, by the way. 15-10 final score. Just the one break for Kruitz on the game's very first point. Both sides with the same number of clean holds, but that's partly because Reading were just on offense a lot less than Kruitz were. Converted on 90%, or a little over 90% of their own points. Just 64% for Kruitz. 
amazing game, great semi-final in the mixed division. We're still waiting to see the results of the other mixed semi-final. But in the meantime, we have the open final coming up straight after this game. It is Clapham facing Mooncatchers. Both teams already qualified for UCF, but still, you want to l win Elite Invite. Before that, though, our very own Hannah Pendlebury has been able to grab two key players for Reading to uh, get their thoughts on what was an engrossing game. Just going to double check that everything is where it needs to be. Turns out the microphone works a lot better if you plug it in. Who knew? I mean, we knew. Let's be honest. Uh, excellent, excellent. There you are, Hannah Pendlebury with uh, Connor Hogan and Rachel Naden. Thank you very much, Benji. Yes, we are here on the sidelines. Congratulations on your automatic qualification spot to the Wrocław later this year. I mean, we're expecting to see you anyway. It's going to be a busy season for both of you. Hoagie, in our Elite Invite preview, I gave a little bit of shade to Reading and said that maybe you didn't have the male matching talent on defence. Who's really stood out for you in the games we haven't seen on the stream? Yeah, you look kind of silly now. Uh, no, 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 jokes, <laughs> jokes. Uh, no, to be fair, I think like, all the guys have put in a huge shift this weekend, especially on day one when we had few, uh, fewer players. Um, three guys kind of stand out. I think on the O-line, Andy Lewis has been incredible for us. Um, and D-line, Joe Brown playing against Seski, you might have seen. Uh, and again today, like him marking the small small ball stuff is like marking a squirrel in the phone box like he's unbelievable and Stephen Millard has blocked everyone it's incredible so those three have really carried it's been awesome yeah well we, we picked our sort of you guys were both stats leaders in the midsection of the game a massive credit to Millard he was really you know stand out in the last stages for you guys there so Rachel it's not your first season on Reading you're returning you're back in the fold with your change of location I know you're very happy to have of course you're captaining a GB women this season already been a good one for you guys so far so what's different about being with Reading this year um, so one of the main reasons I was excited to come back was the connection with Andy Lewis. I know if he gets it under, there's only one direction that I'm heading, which is the end zone. Um, and it's really great that there are now more people that can do that to me. Obviously, Hoagie, Molly Wedge, Withers. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Brilliant. Well, congratulations again. We will see you both in the final in a couple of hours. Go get yourself some hydration. We'll see you there. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So Hannah Pendlebury there with Rachel Naden and Connor Hogan. Fantastic games from the both of them, but Reading got contributions from up and down the roster there to see them into the final this afternoon where they will take on the winner of Disconnection and Deep Space. And I'm sure there's a fair few eyes in the UK watching that game because if Deep Space win, then obviously they get their place booked to EUCF. And if Disconnection win, then it's Lemmings who get the free pass by virtue of their runners up uh, at the Spring Invite in Padova to Disconnection. That game starts at 2.30 local time, so in a little over four hours. But up next, we've got the small matter of the Open Final just under an hour before that one starts. 10 past 11 here in Bern. As Charlotte mentioned earlier, Clapham versus Mooncatchers. You will not want to miss that. For all of our OTTV crew, for Hannah Pendlebury, uh, Steph Rapazzo and Charlotte Terrasson, Benji Reese saying we will see you on the other side for the Open Final.
Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, ultimate. Alti.tv. Everyone looking forward to uh, Chef Anne Rapazzo.